In this final episode of the Politically Incorrect Guide to Pandemics, we're going to talk again about China as the great breeding ground of pandemics. We mentioned that in the first episode. But what we didn't mention was that the Chinese Communist Party has a history of unleashing pandemics on the world. Back in 1957 and 1958, there was a pandemic which was known as the Asian flu. It spread quickly throughout the world. It caused over a million deaths. That would be three or four million deaths with today's increased global population numbers. And it was called the Asian flu because no one at the beginning of the pandemic knew precisely where it had originated. It turned out, we learned several years later, that the pandemic, which was a true zoonosis, it had crossed over from an animal species to human, had done so in the southwest Chinese province of Guizhou. Did the Chinese Communist Party's health authorities tell us that there was a deadly new virus on the loose in China? No, they didn't. Did they warn the World Health Organization? Did they tell us uh, the nature of the virus? Did they send us samples of the virus so that we could develop tests for it and possibly a vaccine? They didn't do any of these things. They covered up the epidemic within China until it spread throughout Asia and from there to the world. This was a pattern that they would follow again in 1968 with the Hong Kong flu. Now, the Hong Kong flu didn't come from Hong Kong. In fact, the people of Hong Kong were very upset that it was named the Hong Kong flu because they knew quite well that across the border from Hong Kong in mainland China, there was an epidemic raging. And it was called the Hong Kong flu because the Chinese Communist Party authorities did the same thing in 1968 that they had done 10 years earlier. They hid the fact that there was an epidemic underway in China. They hid the fact that it was caused by a new zoonosis, a new virus that had crossed over the species barrier into human beings. They didn't warn, warn the World Health Organization or other health authorities. And once again, we had a pandemic that killed uh, roughly a million people globally. The same pattern we saw in 2002-2003 with the SARS-1 epidemic. Now, SARS-1 was the first coronavirus epidemic. That's why it's called SARS-1. The second coronavirus epidemic is SARS-CoV-2. But the first coronavirus epidemic, SARS-1, occurred in, began in November of 2002 when a snake seller in the southern province of Guangdong, during the course of handling snakes or buying snakes or cooking snakes or eating snakes, whatever he was doing, he contracted a snake coronavirus, a very deadly snake coronavirus, that spread rapidly throughout the population of Guangdong province. It killed 11% of the people who were infected. Now, did the Chinese Communist Party do the responsible thing? Did they notify the World Health Organization that there was a deadly virus on the loose? Uh, that it was killing one in 10 or more of the people that it infected? No. They hid the epidemic until it began to spread to other countries. Now, fortunately, the SARS-1 coronavirus was not airborne. It was transmitted by contact with body fluids. So you had to get up close and personal before you could contract the disease. Had it been an airborne respiratory virus, uh, it would have killed 10% of the population of the world in the absence of effective therapeutic drugs and, and vaccines. We only discovered we being the West, only discovered that there was a dangerous new coronavirus on the loose in China in 2003, months later, when Canadian intelligence services picked up wire transmissions that talked of a new and deadly epidemic uh, in China. And we went then to the Chinese authorities and we said, what's going on? 
and they finally reluctantly admitted that they had this snake coronavirus causing an epidemic in China. By then, it had begun to spread to other countries, but it was early enough in the, in the epidemic so that it did not become a pandemic. But we should not thank the Chinese Communist Party for that because it was well on the way to becoming a pandemic when we caught them covering up, hiding uh, what was going on in China. Now, if all that sounds familiar, it should, because that's exactly the same playbook that they followed in 2019. They had a coronavirus on the loose in China in the city of Wuhan, escaped, as we talked about, during vaccine trials. And they failed to warn the world what was happening in Wuhan until it became evident to outside observers that something was going on. And then when we asked them what was going on, they lied about human-to-human -human transmission. And they did one more thing. They closed down transport within China from Wuhan to other Chinese cities, but they allowed planes to go from Wuhan to places like Milan, Italy, and Madrid, Spain, and New York City, which all of which became hotbed centers of the spread of the epidemic. They also silenced whistleblowers. They doctored the data. Uh, and of course, they, they lied about the nature of the virus itself which is clearly, we now know, a bioengineered virus, bioengineered using gain-of-function research to be highly infectious, not as deadly as the snake coronavirus that crossed over into humanity in 2002. But that, again, was deliberate. You see, because China, as the great breeding ground of pandemics, decided after SARS-1, that coronaviruses would make excellent bioweapons. And so they began at that time to work on genetically engineering coronaviruses to be more infectious. Coronavirus is particularly suited to becoming a bioweapon because it's an RNA virus. It only has a single strand of genetic material. There are DNA viruses that have a double strand of genetic material that are a little more difficult to manipulate. So by using an RNA virus, the coronaviruses, they were able to more easily make insertions to make the virus more infectious. As early as uh, 2015, they were writing in Chinese strategy manuals about how coronaviruses would make excellent bioweapons because they were so easy to manipulate genetically. The head of China's bioweapons program, Major General Chun Wei, gave a speech in 2017, a secret speech that we were later able to get our hands on a copy of, in which he said, you must have a sword before you can develop a shield. You must have a sword before you can develop a shield. What was she talking about? She was talking about the fact that if you were developing a bioweapon, you needed first to have the bioweapon itself ready to go, perfected, before you could develop a defense against it. The bioweapon, the virus, was the sword, and the shield, of course, was the vaccine that they were working on in 2019 to protect their own people from the coronavirus when they released it. Of course, the whole process was short-circuited because before they had an effective vaccine, the virus had escaped during vaccine trials. That's what happened. But it was, first you have a sword, then you develop a shield. What happens now? Well, I believe that the release of the China virus on the world was the most successful attack in human history in terms of the number of lives lost, in terms of the economic damage that it caused. The China virus has caused more damage to humanity than any weapon in human history. It makes the nuclear weapons that went off over Nagasaki and Hiroshima that ended World War II look like basically non-events. Because with this bioweapon, what the Chinese call an unrestricted bioweapon, they were able to achieve millions and millions of deaths, 
and tens and tens of trillions of economic damage. And because it was an unrestricted bioweapon, they have not been called to account for the deadly virus that they released upon the world. You see, when we think of bioweapons, a lot of people think in terms of the traditional bioweapons, things like anthrax or releasing smallpox on the world. An unrestricted bioweapon is something different. An unrestricted bioweapon is something that is highly infectious, but not very lethal, and that has a long lag time from infection until you develop symptoms. In other words, it's a weapon that can quietly spread throughout the world's population, causing tremendous economic dislocation and some deaths and much illness, but that is plausibly deniable by the country that released it. And of course, from the get-go, China has been denying that it was responsible for releasing the China virus on the world. It's gone through a number of excuses, dodges, uh, deceitful statements about the origins of the China virus. It said that it came from a bat crossed over into humans at the Wuhan wet market. That's clearly not true because there was no trace of the coronavirus found in the wet market in Wuhan. It said that uh, it had come from the World Military Games held in Wuhan in October 17th through the 24th, that it had been brought in by the U.S. Army athletes who'd come to China to participate in the World Military Games. The Chinese Communist Party actually blamed us for releasing the China virus on China, claiming that it was a bioweapon that had been developed at the Fort Detrick biolabs of the U.S. Army up in Maryland. Clearly another fabrication. Later on, they said it came from a pangolin and passed from this tiny anteater into humanity. Today, they're testing fish and frozen food that come into China. They're claiming that it came from frozen food that was imported from places like Chile and Peru and other countries, any place but China. So they keep making excuses and trying to distract us away from the real origin of the China virus, which was the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and it was part of their bioweapons program. So what are they planning now? Well, we don't have to guess about that because we have the writings of the former head of the National Defense University, who a couple of years ago wrote about the new high ground of warfare. That was the title of his book, The New High Ground of Warfare. And he said the new high ground of biowarfare is the development of ethnically targeted bioweapons. That is to say, viruses that are specifically engineered to be lethal, not to Chinese, Han Chinese, who would have a natural or acquired immunity to the bioweapon, but they would be genetically engineered to be lethal to Koreans or Japanese or Caucasians or Africans. This is what they are working on now in China, ethnically targeted bioweapons. Uh, it's a frightening thought. I'm afraid that lurking in a test tube somewhere in a lab in China, perhaps in the Wuhan Institute of Virology itself, uh, there is another bioweapon or two that will be released at the appropriate time on the world. It will be in all likelihood an unrestricted bioweapon, something that's highly infectious but not very deadly, something that spreads quickly uh, but to which you don't develop symptoms for a week or two. It may be one that is targeted at a specific race, some other race than the Han Chinese. It is a certainty in my mind that unless China is called to account for releasing SARS coronavirus 2 on the world and causing the COVID-19 pandemic with its millions of lives lost and trillions of dollars in economic damage, they will do it again. Why wouldn't they?